It happened to be a cold November night. I was uh, driving home from the station. Now, when I first moved to Cleveland, people told me, well, you want to live on the east side of Cleveland. You know, I don't know why. But I made the mistake of the first apartment that I took when I moved here was in East Cleveland. <laughs> I realized I'd made a mistake when I thought I heard fireworks going off one night and they, they weren't fireworks. Uh, but the station at the time was at 50th and Euclid, where the, the same building the Agora is in today. And um, except we were in a windowless bunker. Uh, that, uh, it was a decrepit place, so I said. But all, all we would see every day, all I would see is, because I just moved to Cleveland, i drive from East Cleveland down Euclid Avenue to 50th and Euclid and drive home at the end of the night. So all I was seeing, I would drive through back then, as soon as you cross East 55th Street, there was this little sign that said, you're entering Mayor Perks Model Cities Program. Well, the Model Cities program was nothing but abandoned buildings all the way to East 105th. And you hit East 105th, and there was a theater and a little bit of life and some nightclubs, and then you'd go back to more desolation until you hit University Circle. And then once you pass the University Circle in that area, you go back to devastation all the way to where I live. So it was one particular, one of those, those, those November evenings where it's just sleep and miserable and all that, and I'm driving home from work, and Denny plays Desolation Row by uh, Bob Dylan. And if you've heard that song, you know the lyrics, it's really, a, it's a downer song. Uh, and it was kind of a perfect soundtrack. Now at the same time, Cle uh, Cleveland, was going through a very rough period of time, and Fortune 500 companies were leaving. And, and Cleveland used to be the home of so many Fortune 500 companies, and they were all leaving to move elsewhere. And I think it might have been Diamond Shamrock was the latest one to say, you know, where they announced, we are moving our corporate headquarters out of Cleveland. We don't know where we're moving to, we just want out of Cleveland. And all you would read about with Cleveland is, you know, the, the Cuyahoga River catching on fire was still fresh in everybody's minds. Uh, when Perk opened the factory, when the Sutherland Church and uh, torch and caught his hair on fire, that was still fresh in everybody's mind. And the joke was, you know, what city did both the river and the mayor's hair catch on fire, but not at the same time? So I mean, all I'm hearing since I moved to Cleveland from Boston is all this how terrible the city is and how everybody's moving out. And I'm, you know, I'm from out of town and I'm looking at it a different way. I'm seeing a park system, I'm seeing a lake, I'm seeing a lot of potential in the city. I'm, I'm looking at it from totally different eyes. Uh, to make a long story short, you know, I, Denny's playing Desolation Row, it's sleep, I'm driving through all these, you know, row after, you know, block after block of abandoned buildings, and it's like, you know, I say, God, this city is dying. And then it just flashed like, well, what would you expect to see flying over a dying city? Buzzes. And so I told, next day he came into work, I mentioned to Denny, I said, how about a buzzard? And Denny said, a buzzard? And I said, no, hear me out. And I said, it's your fault too. You, and I explained the whole thing to him. And he kind of said, yeah, that may actually work. But then who is going to draw the buzzard? And we did have this person, this artist, I can't remember his name right now, uh, who was doing some ads for us. He worked at Tokyo Shapiro. Do you remember Tokyo Shapiro? I, the strangest name for an audio store in the world. And it, it got, I guess, I, I, all I can tell is that they got the name Tokyo Shapiro because all they sold was made in Japan audio equipment. And Shapiro, I think, was the name of the people that founded it. So that's how they got their name. But anyway, this artist worked at Tokyo Shapiro. And we, he was sort of moonlighting and doing odds and ends. He wasn't a great artist. But we looked and said, OK, maybe he's the guy who can draw the buzz. Well, Tokyo Shapiro found out he was moonlighting and banned him from doing anything other than Tokyo Shapiro work. So we were at a loss for uh, having an artist. And we had a show on at the time called the National Lampoon Radio Hour. And it was like Sunday nights at 9 or 10. I think it was Sunday nights at 9 o'clock. And they had run a special, and it was actually the the cast that ended up becoming the, the first cast of Saturday Night Live, 
the Lucy and Aykroyd and Gilda Red and all these people were part of uh, this National Lampoon Radio Hour. And they ran the Nixon in Exile special. They did a one hour on Nixon resigning and all this. And 7 Up uh, was one of the sponsors, one of the national sponsors of the show. Well, the chairman of 7 Up was very close to Nixon, so needless to say, when that ran, he was insulted. He pulled his advertising, and that was a big chunk. National Lampoon Radio Hour couldn't afford to do an hour show a week. They could do a half hour show, but not an hour. So they called up all the stations explaining what happened and the Nixon thing. And you know, to make a long story short, most stations, or pretty much all stations agreed, okay, we'll run the half hour show. You know, instead of running the full show, we'll run the half hour show. And what they didn't tell us is National Lampoon radio, uh, the, the radio people played a joke on us. At the end of the half hour, they said, this radio station is censoring the next half hour of this show. If you don't like it, please notify the station immediately. So I come in Monday morning into work, and there are all these little pink, you know, this is pre-voicemail. All these pink, you know, while you're out, those, those you know, telephone messages. Dozens and dozens of them, of people, you know, I mean, just saying, I'll never listen to you again, and you're a censorship. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's wrong, because I didn't hear that on the air the previous night. I didn't hear the, the close. So I can't figure it out. And, you know, as soon as I got in, there was another phone call. I pick up the phone, and somebody just starts swearing at me, and how dare you, you know, censor and all that. You were supposed to be the good guys and everything else. So, we finally, I finally get a phone call that stays long enough to explain what they heard. And I said, well, th that was a joke. No, it wasn't a joke, because they said it had to be true. So Denny and I walk in the production studio, and we listen, and sure enough, it's there. And anyway, to make a long story short, I'm furious. I caught National Lampoon screaming and all that. Well, for the next few days, we're getting letters coming in. Just, you know, you guys, I like you guys, but why did you censor this? And there's no way, no matter how we tried to explain it, people didn't believe us. And then one letter happened to come in the form of the comic strip, and that was David Helton. And it was, it was a, a three-panel comic strip. It's in the book, uh, where it's this guy who has long hair, and he's smoking a joint, and he's leaning against this giant radio, listening to National Lampoon Radio, and all of a sudden, this giant mushroom comes crashing down on the radio, and he's like, what's going on? And uh, it, it ends with this guy saying, you guys have a great radio station, but you shouldn't have sent it to the National Lampoon Radio. I look at it, and I show it to Denny, and we say, we found the artist. Now, the only trouble, the return address of David West Boulevard, Cleveland. That was it. There was no other address. And so... We tried to track him down. I was like, well, who in the world? Okay, we know he lives on West Boulevard. We know he lives somewhere. We know his first name is David. What do we do from there? Somehow, through a whole process of elimination, we did reach American greetings, and is there a David that works there and all that? And it turns out that he doesn't get the message, but his girlfriend, who also worked at, at the American greetings, got the message and passed it on to him. And we made contact, and uh, we explained to him. He, he came down to the station, and uh, we explained that we had this idea to do a buzzing. And, uh, you know, he said, we have this mushroom logo. We sort of want to phase it out, but we can't phase it out right away. And on top of that, the management of the station, the owner and the managers, that the people I had to answer, absolutely hated the buzzer. What do you, what's a buzzard? What does it have to do with rock and roll? What does it have to do with Cleveland? What does it have to do with anything? And we didn't want to tell anyone the reason how we came up with the idea. We just said, well, it's cool. You know, we just want to try something different. And, you know, it, it, this is also in the book, and it's too long to get into, but it took us a long while to establish the buzzard where, you know, the management of the station finally said, yeah, that's a good idea. Go with it. We were already, we were already going with it. What we did is we set up the, this... In those days, you know, you could, uh, you know, trade advertising with uh, different magazines. And there was a magazine that came out called uh, Zeppelin. And we had an ad in it every week. And so we decided, well, 
you know, we'll use that. And David drew the buzzard. He drew the first buzzard ad, which I'll I'll show in a in a few minutes. And uh, so it was running for weeks. We knew the the owners and the management weren't going to read Zeppelin magazine, so we were sort of flying under the radar. And you know, it was it was the early days, so you could get away with those kind of things. But we sort of forced the buzzard issue on everyone, and it it, it worked. But David, in the process, David Helton moved from West Boulevard to uh, Lake Road, right near Cove. There's that gas station there, or it's, I think it's Mr. Tire or something now. Well, David lived in the first apartment building to the east of that gas station in a basement apartment. And it was in that basement apartment that he drew the first buzzer. And also, all this animation you see here, David did that animation in his living room. Frame by frame, what he he and a friend of his, uh, who also worked in American Greetings, Jim Elliott, they literally, you know, got all the cellophane, all this, all the cells, and frame by frame put those those together. And so everything that was done back at that radio station, I was, I mean, it was literally homegrown. And you can take that any way you, <laughs> you want, <laughs> but. Uh, so, I mean, for, for all practical purposes, you can say that the buzzard was invented in Lakewood. Uh, also, there are two other, re two other uh, parts of Lakewood that, that come into play with MMS. Uh, Jeff Kinsbach was born in, uh, he was actually born in LA, but moved, his, his parents were originally from, and they moved back to Cleveland, they moved back to Cleveland and settled in Lakewood. So Jeff grew up in Lakewood, and uh, when I met him, he uh, lived in the, uh, those apartments, um, Right near, there's a high rise right near the Beck Center on, the, on, on uh, uh, Detroit Road. He lived in that building. And the third problem was one of the two key record stores that we paid attention to was Melody Lane in Lakewood. And it's, I think, there's a, what, a record exchange there now? Yeah. I, it's on, right, it's almost across the street. Uh, and. There was Record Revolution on Coventry and Melody Lane in Lakewood, and they were the two, uh, we could tell if we played something new, they were the first two uh, you know, uh, uh, record stores that would start to show interest in the product. Because I mean, back, and we were playing some bizarre, you know, the first time you heard Roxy music, everybody thought it was the weirdest thing in the world. But you, we would start to see sales, the, you know, the Roxy music, the New York Dolls, all the cutting edge kind of stuff, all the new stuff that we play, artists that, or previously unknown, it would always be Record Revolution and Melody Lane as they were sort of barometers. If we started seeing sales coming from those stores, we knew that we had something we could work and develop on. And if we didn't see any reaction from these stores, we knew that uh, people just weren't interested in the, uh, you know, in that, that, that artist. 